This is the site of one of the most remarkable military operations of the Second World War. A bold attempt by the Allies to finish the war early by combining a ground offensive with the biggest landing of airborne troops ever seen. The operation failed. Critical errors were made, both in planning and in execution. Remarkable courage was displayed by the Allied troops here in Arnhem, and at this one bridge in particular. Ultimately, it would not be enough. In the late summer of 1944, Germany was in full retreat on the Western Front. The conquest of Normandy and the liberation of Paris seemed to herald the imminent defeat of Hitler. By early September, Allied troops were sweeping forward in three enormous army groups. Army Group 6, under General Jacob Davis, Army Group 12, commanded by General Omer Bradley, which included the famous Third Army of George Patton, and Army Group 21, commanded by Field Marshal Sir Bernard Montgomery. Victory seemed assured, but the Allies knew that a direct thrust into Germany's heartland would be risky. The western frontier of the Reich was defended by the considerable defensive fortifications of the Siegfried Line. In addition, the sheer size of the Allied battlefront was now causing problems. To take 21st Army Group, Montgomery's Army Group, as an example, they were advancing by late August, early September, on average about 50 miles a day. And now what you have there is an Army Group advancing at very great speed with their logistics stretching right the way back to the Normandy beaches, about 300 miles. Uh, and in terms of supplies, that meant every single bullet, every piece of uniform, every piece of equipment, and above all the fuel had to be drawn all the way along these tremendously stretched, overstretched supply lines. So from the start, the Allies were beginning to encounter some severe difficulties. Montgomery was not the only Allied leader to appreciate the difficulty of fighting on such a broad front, but his plan to solve the difficulty was remarkable. Montgomery had always been regarded as a cautious commander, but the strategy he now suggested was radical and unprecedented. He proposed that a British corps of troops should sweep upwards from the Dutch border into occupied territory to the west of the Siegfried Line. Having passed this so-called West Wall, the Corps could then turn right and attack the heartland of Germany itself. The troops fighting on the ground would be supported by three further divisions. These would arrive simultaneously from the air and secure a corridor through which the ground corps could advance in safety. This airborne component of approximately 35,000 men was named Operation Market. At the same time, Lieutenant General Brian Horrocks would lead north his 30 Corps along the so-called Club Route. This part of the operation was codenamed Garden, and the whole enterprise was thus codenamed Operation Market Garden. If Montgomery's strategy did succeed, it could mean a speedy end to the war, perhaps even by Christmas. No one could dispute the potential prize on offer, 
but many senior figures had grave concerns about Montgomery's plan. I think that there were very many commanders that were anxious, concerned about the Allied plan for Market Garden. Some of them were intelligence officers, perhaps the most famous being uh, Major Brian Urquhart, and he thought that there were great problems with the strength of the Germans that were in and around the Arnhem area. They could be justified after the enormous success the Allies had had in Normandy and thinking that really the German army was already beaten. The job had been done, but as the Germans were to demonstrate both on the Eastern Front and on the Western Front, this was not uh, an army which would lie down easily. Ultimately, the decision would rest with Eisenhower and his political masters. The prize was such that although the risks were, were great, ultimately he knew that he had to take the gamble uh, and proceed with Operation Market Garden because if they had succeeded with that, uh, it would certainly have brought about a catastrophic collapse in the German war effort. So it was worth it in that risk and, and Eisenhower eventually acceded to that. He himself wanted to see as quick an end to the war in Europe as possible, with as few Allied casualties, especially American casualties, as possible. On Sunday the 10th of September, the decision was made to implement Montgomery's proposal. On the same day, the British Armoured Guards Division captured this canal bridge near to the Belgium-Holland border. Known as Joe's Bridge, this would be the starting point for the operation, which would begin just seven days later. The key to Operation Market Garden were the bridges located within the corridor. Five of these were strategically essential, and their capture was the responsibility of the three airborne divisions. The American 101st Airborne Division was allocated the area around Eindhoven. Their mission was to capture the Wilhelmina and Zeit Willemswaard canal bridges. Further north, Brigadier General James Gavin would lead his 82nd Airborne Division to take the river bridges at Grave and at Nijmegen. The final bridge would be the responsibility of the British 1st Airborne Division, together with the Polish Parachute Brigade, part of the newly formed 1st Airborne Corps. Theirs was the bridge at Arnhem. Major General Stanislav Sosobowski harbored grave doubts about the task that lay ahead. Significantly, his Polish Parachute Brigade would not be launched on the first day of the operation. A shortage of transport aircraft meant that 1st Airborne Corps would be deployed over three successive days, with Sosobowski's men arriving last. It's a, a crucial element of airborne landings is surprise. You should take people by surprise and turn up when and where they least expect it. To bring in reinforcements in dribs and drabs meant if it was not successful, completely successful on the first day, there was a danger that the air defences would go stronger as the second and third wave came in. And more importantly, the enemy on the ground would be aware that there were likely to be other landings and would be prepared for those. In addition, of course, over three days, you've got the vagaries of the weather. Having been committed, it is quite conceivable that you will not be able to reinforce at the main point of effort. And in fact, this happened. Those first British troops would not be landing at Arnhem or even next to it. Parachutists and gliders need a large open area with firm ground that are clear from as many obstacles as is possible. Now, the only possible opportunity for the 1st British Airborne Division to land in an area like that was to choose landing areas that were some eight miles um, from the centre of Arnhem and their major objective. Landing eight miles away from the bridge was a very difficult undertaking for uh, troops who after all would be advancing on foot. They had very few vehicles and many of those vehicles in the event did go to astray, so the actual choice of the site, I suppose, would be questionable because of its distance from the town of Arnhem. The Germans themselves felt in a post-operational report that came out within days of the landings that actually the British were quite cunning in dropping where they did. 
Um, they were some distance away from the drop zone and they were effectively screened by the line of trees which lie to the west of Arnhem. The Germans could not then decide or calculate how strong the landings were. They could not precisely locate where the Allies had landed and of course put those two factors together. They didn't really appreciate what the likely objective was. Late in the evening of Saturday, September the 16th, 1944, 200 British Lancaster bombers took off on raids designed to soften up the German defences in Holland. The following morning, some 800 American flying fortress bombers joined the attack. Meanwhile, in England, 22 airfields were a hive of activity as the American and British troops boarded their planes and gliders. But the briefing, uh, as always, I think was very, very good. We understood the plan, we knew what it was all about, and we knew the uh, ultimate objective stood, which was to uh, circle around and go into the Ruhr with uh, 30 Corps when they arrived. The weather was good, as predicted. And at 0930, the first Skytrain glider towers took off, followed by the Dakota paratroop carriers. In the air, two columns of aircraft formed up over the English towns of March and Hatfield. Each then set off on a predetermined route to Holland. It was a remarkable sight. Each column of aircraft was 94 miles long and three miles wide. Over a thousand troop carriers were joined by over 500 tug-pulled gliders a total of over 2,000 aircraft. We've been fed on success from the airborne landings on D-Day, and uh, we were reasonably confident, especially then, which after all, uh, they were talking about the war being over by Christmas. This was September. And I think uh, everyone was quite happy and uh, very, very confident, overconfident going in. According to our way of thinking, there was no reason why it shouldn't be a success. Fighter support was also substantial. 371 British Spitfires, Tempests and Mosquitoes and 548 American Thunderbolts, Lightnings and Mustangs. Once we were airborne, it, things went reasonably well until we were running in over the, uh, the canals in, uh, on the continent where the Germans had uh, a certain number of barges with anti-aircraft guns on. We were flying fairly low at about 1,500 foot, 2,000 foot. So there was a certain amount of confusion by the anti-aircraft fire coming up amongst the stream of uh, aircraft. In the early afternoon, the gliders began to land and the paratroopers began to descend into their strategic drop zones. Here we are on drop zone X, where the 1st Parachute Brigade and the Brigadier Lethbury landed. 1st, 2nd and 3rd Battalions. They didn't know what to expect, a hairy experience, but there were hardly any Germans here. So the landings went, as they say, like, like an exercise. Operation Market had begun well. This Allied deployment for Market Garden was totally unprecedented. We've got to remember, and, and perhaps few people do remember this, that airborne warfare was in its very earliest years. The British and the Americans had been toying and playing with the airborne concept for a few years, but really the idea had only been taken up by the Germans, the Italians and the Russians early in the war, and they'd had some disasters. From the German perspective, what one should really realise is that this drop occurred in its rear combat zone. Where these troops were stationed and were suddenly um, faced with this unexpected enemy, um, it took some two hours drive to move from where they were to the front line. So they were not anticipating in any shape or form um, a drop of that magnitude on their positions. At 1400 hours, the battle began in earnest as Lieutenant General Brian Horrocks ordered a huge artillery barrage here at Joe's Bridge opening the way to Arnhem. At 2.35, Cromwell tanks of the Armoured Guards Division began their journey north, supported by a brigade of infantry on the sides of the road. To the north, 
the American troops of 101st Airborne Division were quickly into action, capturing the Zeit Willemswaard Canal Bridge and forcing the Germans to blow the nearby Wilhelmina Bridge at Sonn. Meanwhile, James Gavin's 82nd Airborne were able to capture the Grave Road Bridge and now prepare to take the giant bridge over the Waal at Nijmegen. But this would be a far more difficult objective. It would take the Allies three days to take this half-mile structure. On the second day of the operation, men from the 508th Parachute Infantry were close to capturing it on no less than three occasions. On each occasion, they were beaten back. Further north still, the British 1st Airborne Division were also keen to pursue their objectives, but soon found themselves hampered. During the flight from England, a number of gliders were lost through broken tow ropes. Some of these craft had contained precious motor vehicles. Their loss would greatly hamper British mobility in the race to Arnhem Bridge. Perversely, the local civilian population also became a problem when, delighted at their apparent liberation, they rushed out of their homes to greet the British troops, offering them food, drink and other gifts. It was entirely understandable, but it served only to slow the British advance. Many of the maps supplied to the paratroopers were also inadequate, and it was quickly apparent that there were serious faults with the radios supplied. Either they failed to work at all, or their range was feeble and their reception poor. There are a great number te of technical problems with the, the radios at Arnhem, and those radios that we used had been shown to be unreliable before the Battle of Arnhem. I think a likely reason for the faults was the fact that there had been so many aborted airborne operations prior to this one, it could well have been that many of those radios had not had their batteries replenished and when the drop occurred for real, um, to their horror, people were probably discovering that um, they were having battery problems rather than straight radio problems. Which meant that at vital times during the battle, commanders couldn't communicate forward, sideways, rearwards or to their headquarters back in England. And this meant that the, the plan le lacked the coordination that it had initially had. On the morning of the 17th of September, a senior German officer sat in his headquarters here at the Hartenstein Hotel in Oosterbeek, just three miles west of Arnhem Bridge. The soldier concerned was Field Marshal Walter Model. Field Marshal Model, the German, and his staff was in this building. And um, when the British landed, they fled, and they left the tables laid out for lunch with uh, smoked eel and salmon and things we hadn't seen for years. And uh, the British ducked in, but they were chased out by their commanding officers. They decided to stay here for the night only and then go on to Arnhem. But the next morning it was too late and they couldn't get through. So this became the headquarters of the 1st Airborne Division until the 25th. The British troops were led to believe that the Arnhem area would be only lightly defended. Children, invalids, old men on bicycles. The exact opposite would prove to be the case. Field Marshal Mordel quickly convened a meeting with his colleague, Willy Bittrich. General Bittrich knew exactly the forces that he had available just a few miles to the north and east of the Arnhem area. This was no ramshackle army. Withdrawn after the fighting in Normandy, it was the 8th and 9th SS Panzer Divisions. Dutch intelligence had warned the British that panzers were situated in the region. The warnings were ignored. The consequences were severe. The amount of intelligence that was flowing into various headquarters during this rush out of the Normandy beachheads through to Berlin was astronomical and it would be very difficult to assimilate, to collate, to disseminate all of that information. But what is true is that the Allies knew exactly what they would be facing in Arnhem. 
I suppose what took them by surprise was just how quickly the Germans had been able to refit and re-equip two panzer divisions in particular, the 8th and 9th SS panzer divisions, which were full of um, what you would call, I suppose, fanatics. They were troops who were dedicated to the Nazi cause, and these were the men who were to demonstrate that they were by no means a beaten enemy. Three hours after the British began to land, German defensive strategy was in place. Bittrich dispatched his 9th Panzer Division towards Arnhem, and his 10th towards Nijmegen. Troops already in the Arnhem area were put on battle alert, including three infantry battalions and two SS depot battalions under the command of Major Zepp Kraft. This gifted soldier quickly deployed his troops into defensive positions around Arnhem, knowing full well that the panzers would soon arrive to take up the fight. By contrast, the nearest British heavy armour was over 50 miles to the south. The British paratroopers would not have an easy ride, and their chances of success were soon compromised further. Shortly after the insertion of the first airborne wave, one of the probably American Waco gliders was shot down and one of students, Feldwebels, a senior NCO, found um, apparently a copy of the orders for Operation Market Garden. And from that point onwards, although the Allies don't know it, the Germans are acutely aware of every single move that's about to be made. It's a very complex operation and, and so many things are already in chain that even had the Allies the inkling that the plans had fallen to the Germans, it's very doubtful whether they would actually be able to stop the operation anyway. The men of the 1st British Parachute Brigade were unaware of the true strength of their enemy as they set off towards Arnhem Bridge just before four o'clock that afternoon but they were soon to find out. In command was Brigadier Gerald Lathbury, with his divisional commander, Roy Urquhart, also in attendance. Three battalions of the Parachute Regiment were now engaged, taking three separate routes. The Battle of Arnhem was underway, and the speed of the British advance would be vital. North of Wolfhäser, Lieutenant Colonel David Doby of the 1st Battalion soon discovered that the German defences were considerable. Panzers were deployed alongside keen infantrymen who were certainly not old men on bicycles. These were the so-called Verrupta helmets, or crazy helmets. These were people who'd lost their families, um, probably in Eastern Prussia, or as a result of the bombing, so there was nothing left for them to live for after the war. So these people fought as fanatics. They had nothing to look forward to, and they had a sort of slogan which um, roughly translated means, enjoy the war while you can, because the peace is going to be terrible. One para's losses were high, and Doby was forced to halt in the woods with no chance of reaching the bridge that day. To the south, Lieutenant Colonel Fitch encountered similar difficulties leading the 3rd Battalion. Despite their success in killing Arnhem's German Commandant, General Kussin. Shortly afterwards, they too were stopped by mortar fire. Only the 2nd Battalion was able to make significant progress as the streets of Arnhem resounded with the impact of the battle. Street fighting is not easy because if you go down a main route and then you get mortared and shelled at the same time, you tend, the soldiers tend to disperse either side and it becomes a sort of mix-up. And so much so, I, I think probably one para and three para at one stage were possibly shooting each other. Having gone into the back garden and three para were, were on their right, you lose con control. And then you've got to find out where this, the shelling has come from and try and deal with it. It's not easy. And it's much easier for the defence than the attack. Second Battalion took the southernmost route to Arnhem Bridge, near the lower Rhine River, and carefully made their way through streets infested with snipers. In command was Lieutenant Colonel John Frost, one of the most respected paratroopers in the British Army. 
Unfortunately for Frost, German troops were able to blow up Arnhem Railway Bridge before he could capture it. But by 8 o'clock, two para had arrived at the northern end of the road bridge. Two British attempts to take the southern side were repulsed by German armour, though the British did destroy a German generating room isolated on the northern side of the bridge in a flamethrower attack. They get to the bridge on the evening of the, of the 17th of September and quickly find that the water is cut off. They only have the amount of ammunition that they themselves can carry to sustain them throughout the battle. The same goes for their medical supplies and their food. So after a few German counter-attacks, they are low on ammunition, they are low on food, they are low on water, and they've got no prospect of any support until the rest of the division can get through to them, which of course they never do, or 30 Corps relieve them coming up the corridor and crossing the bridge. As Sunday turned into Monday, Frost dug in and awaited reinforcements. The following morning, the attack resumed before sunrise with the British paratroopers in action against an ever-strengthening enemy. John Frost and two para continued to hold position at the bridge with a force of some 500 men. An armoured German attempt to attack from the south side with armour was also dealt with by two para's anti-tank mines and guns. The anti-tank artillerymen were able to knock out three German Mark IVs, Panzer Mark IVs, as they advanced to and assault the parachuters' positions in that area. A standard British issue six-pounder anti-tank gun was able to take on most of the German armour, but once they started to introduce things like the Tiger tank and the later marks of Panzers, this weapon system was not capable of destroying those vehicles from the front. It might have been able to damage their wheels or their tracks, but to take them head on, their armour was too thick. Ultimately, it was German artillery that proved most effective. It would have been hell on earth. The German Tiger tanks pounding away at the houses, the wounded screaming as though they were being burnt alive in the houses, um, the self-propelled guns, the mortars, damaging the houses beyond recognition. The, the physical conditions were terrible. Meanwhile, desperate attempts were being made to get through to Frost's position. But one battalion found itself held back in heavy fighting near the railway station, and many British paratroopers fell victim to German snipers as the street fighting intensified. Nearby, in the area around the hospital, three para attempted to break through. But here it was the bigger German guns that prevented progress. Once again, the panzers proved their devastating effectiveness. Four battalions had been sent to reinforce Frost troops at the bridge. They were not in contact because of the difficulties with the radios with the headquarters at the Hartenstein. So General Urquhart and Brigadier Lathbury decided to go and have a look. And they drove up here, which was still possible then, and uh, there was heavy fighting going on and all of a sudden they were chased by the Germans and had to flee into a house. They came into this house behind me and they went into the attic and then a German tank appeared and it stopped right here and the crew got out and it stayed here. Brigadier Lathbury was seriously injured by a sniper's bullet and had to go into hiding, later to be taken captive. General Urquhart would be trapped here the whole day, unable to contact his colleagues, as it had now become painfully apparent that the British radio sets were little better than useless. You will never achieve the communications that you wish to achieve in battle because of the total chaos that you're surrounded with. You do the best that you can. And I believe that those problems that the um, forward um, platoons and companies would have had in communicating to the rear are not unique, even in a modern age. Now, those early problems were eventually ameliorated. But the problem is, of course, is that by the time the communication situation is enhanced and we do see commanders talking locally to each other, 
there's very little that communications can do to ameliorate the situation. By the stage that the communications are enhanced, the situation is already lost. At the divisional headquarters near to the landing zones, Brigadier Hicks took over in the absence of General Urquhart. Hicks was commander of the Air Landing Brigade, which comprised the three other three British battalions dropped on the first day. The inadequacies of the radios meant that Hicks could do little to relieve Frost and two para at the bridge. But the new commander knew that reinforcements were due to arrive that day in the form of the 4th Parachute Brigade, with the poles to follow 24 hours later. But by now, the worst Allied fears were beginning to come true. Bad weather in England meant that the transports did not arrive until mid-afternoon, and the Germans knew they were coming. Heavy anti-aircraft fire combined with a substantial Luftwaffe presence made it a difficult deployment. Twenty Allied escort fighters were lost, ensuring that Brigadier John Hackett's three battalions made it to the ground safely. The deteriorating weather conditions in England had a disastrous effect on the ground. It meant that the paratroops already engaged were going to be deprived of reinforcements. Uh, this was particularly the case with the Poles who were further delayed. Major General Sosabowski's Polish Independent Brigade is dropped not on the 19th, but actually on the 21st. And it fulfilled many of the fears that he'd had about the operation. They really needed to have been concentrated into a shorter space of time. And what we're finding, it's taken longer and longer to get reinforcements in to support these already very lightly armed troops in the first place. Early in the morning of the 19th of September, one para and three para made a final desperate attempt to reach their colleagues at the bridge, moving along the lower Rhine, using the morning fog as cover. When it lifted, they were exposed to massive German fire from both north and south. The two battalions were virtually wiped out. To the north, Hackett's 4th Brigade also suffered heavy casualties around the railway line. Perhaps worst of all, the ground troops to the south were still far from the Arnhem battle zone. As many had feared, the advance through the corridor was proceeding too slowly. At Nijmegen, the American 505th Parachute Infantry tried once again to take the bridge. Despite support from British guards who had finally reached the battle zone, the attack was repulsed. The only good news for the British was Roy Urquhart's escape from his hiding place and his speedy return to his headquarters, now established at the Hartenstein Hotel, the same hotel evacuated by his enemy, Field Marshal Maudel. But it was Maudel and the Germans who were now winning. And at Arnhem Bridge, the British were suffering. They were in a very desperate situation. They were exhausted. They, they would have been defending houses that were literally piles of rubble, and, and the wounded were being tended in terrible conditions. Supplies dwindle, casualties mount, the enemy's much more aware of where the positions actually are. So the longer they have to wait, the more and more difficult that already difficult task becomes. It was a desperate situation. But when Frost was formally invited to surrender by a German officer, he dismissed the idea out of hand. His battalion would fight to the end. The following day, Wednesday, at Arnhem Bridge, the German shells continued to rain down on two Paris positions. There was one respite when Freddy Goff, who had taken over from John Frost, because he was wounded, had a truce. Uh, so he could evacuate some of the wounded. The Germans took them away. Uh, that even had its problems because the Germans then established even more secure positions while the truce was going on. On the morning of Thursday, September the 21st, 1944, the Germans launched their final assault on Arnhem Bridge, knowing that victory was theirs. But the tenacity of the surviving British soldiers was remarkable. So they were hardened soldiers. Uh, and the Germans respected them so much so 
They never did. It sort of concentrated attack into us. They did it in ones and twos. The British paratroopers had to be flushed out, literally room by room, in gritty close quarter fighting. The British defenders were by now being systematically blasted out of the buildings by the German combat groups, who were now a lot more organized than they had been earlier in the battle. And the sequence of events would follow a pattern of direct engagement by heavy artillery, simply blast holes into the buildings. Having achieved a hole, flamethrower teams would then come forward and douse the lot with um, petroleum and set everything on fire. By midday, both sides of Arnhem Bridge were in German possession. Despite the bravery of John Frost and his men, it really had been a bridge too far. Frost holds out at Arnhem Bridge from the 17th right the way through to the 21st. And what we see as a result of this tenacity and this bravery for the whole division is the award of four Victoria Crosses and hundreds of other decorations for bravery. And I think it's remarkable just how long they managed to hold on in that position and it's why it's still celebrated as a great feat. The German capture of the Arnhem Bridge may not have been inevitable if the situation to the south had evolved differently. The American airborne forces had performed extremely well, despite their mobility being hampered. The road to Arnhem was reserved for the British, so American paratroopers were compelled to move out across country. But by the 20th, all the American target bridges had been taken, including the mighty road bridge at Nijmegen. This giant construction was finally captured the day before the fall of Arnhem Bridge, and only after a magnificent operation in which the Americans joined forces with their British allies. That day, the 20th, saw the 504th Parachute Regiment of the US 82nd Airborne Division cross the river in storm boats, despite the closest attentions of enemy gunners. Having succeeded in crossing, they paused only to signal their success across the water and began to fight their way towards the northern end of the bridge. At that point, British army intervened. Over the previous three days, General Horrocks had led his 30 Corps from Joe's Bridge north along the road known as the Club Route. By Tuesday, the spearhead of 30 Corps had reached Nijmegen. But it was Wednesday at six o'clock when the first British Cromwell tanks began to cross the bridge. What followed was a moment of high drama that can rarely have been rivaled in the history of war. Field Marshal Maudel had issued specific orders that the bridge should not be blown. It would be too valuable in the event of a German counteroffensive. But Brigade Führer Harmel had decided to disobey his orders and set up the explosives to blow the bridge. As the tanks made their crossing, he gave the order to detonate. But the charges failed to go off. Nijmegen Bridge, just 10 miles from Arnhem, was in Allied hands. But it had all taken time. General Gavin had arrived here on the first day of the operation, but was prevented from crossing that day and the next, by stiff German resistance. When the British arrived from the south on the Tuesday, the way north was blocked, and would remain so until the bridge was eventually taken. Subsequent progress was also slow. The battle-weary guards could not advance further that night without infantry support, and it was Thursday morning before the Irish and Welsh guards set off towards Arnhem. The Americans, who had gone to so much trouble to capture the railway bridge and the other bri the uh, traffic bridge as well, were livid. When the um, British finally captured the Nijmegen bridge, there were no German forces between it and Frost, who still at that time had remnants holding out on the bridge um, at Arnhem. They didn't know there wasn't a single German. But there was a question that the Grenadier Guards Division had to stop for refueling and they said they didn't have enough infantry, so they stopped for the night. And if they hadn't done that, they would have reached Frost, certainly. 
News of the capture of Nijmegen Bridge boosted the morale of Urquhart and his surviving troops, who had now drawn themselves into a pocket at Osterbeek, to the west of Arnold. British heavy artillery fire could now be deployed from the south against the encircling Germans to the north. They started firing, supporting us on the southern side of the Vaal at Nijmegen, and it was very heavy firepower they could give us. But it couldn't always do that because ammunition supply had its problems because the route was cut by the Germans on two occasions. I think we'd gotten down to three rounds of gun at one stage. But then ammunition fortunately came through and so we continued. It was not a moment too soon. Thursday saw the Germans capture the high ground at Vesterberving to the west of the British pocket. That afternoon, the Polish paratroopers also arrived. They land into terrible conditions. The Germans have the Wester Bowing Heights, they're mortaring and machine gunning the, the poles whilst they're still in the air, and immediately they get on the ground. And it's a horrendous situation for the Poles. Sosobowski was quick to get into the fray, deploying his 500 men to the immediate south of the Lower Rhine at Driel. Immediately, the Germans responded by placing 2,500 men between Sosobowski's troops and the British position. The Poles would have to cross the river to give support to Urquhart in the pocket. On Friday the 22nd, 30 Corps made further efforts to advance the final miles to Arnhem, but found itself held back once more. At Elst, the combined efforts of the Irish Guards and the British 129th Brigade failed to break through the German lines. The 214th Brigade and the 43rd Division were also deployed, but only one battalion from this latter division succeeded in joining up with the Poles, along with a small armoured detachment of the Household Cavalry. Urquhart and his men remained encircled on three sides. Now, they too began to suffer as their manpower and their supplies began to dwindle. It was a case of scrounging through the houses and getting whatever you could get. Some of the supplies that actually were dropped opened the big panniers and you found uh, berries and uh, cap badges and uh, underclothes. It wasn't food or ammunition or water or anything like that. They were still working on plan A which was to invade, <laughs> invade Germany. And uh, after the fifth and sixth days, they were still dropping stuff for the, for the grand triumphal entry into uh, Germany, capture Germany. That night, on the banks of the Lower Rhine, the Poles attempted to cross the river in small rubber boats in a brave mission of support for their British allies. Frustrated for so long, they now showed their enormous courage as they took to the water in the full face of withering German fire. Of approximately 50 men who made the crossing, 35 made it to the British positions on the north side. The following day, Saturday the 23rd, a crossing attempt was made by men of the Dorset Regiment who had fought their way to the river. It too resulted in substantial loss of life although a second Polish crossing that night got 200 troops safely to the other side. Throughout Saturday, Urquhart's forces were only able to hold their position because of artillery support from the south. In spite of the fact that 30 Corps had at last achieved its objective and secured the Allied corridor from the border to Arnhem, the operation was over. By Sunday the 24th, it was increasingly clear that the battle at Oosterbeek was lost. Just like John Frost's troop at Arnhem Bridge, Urquhart's troops, the remainder of the division, were having similar problems. Tanks, self-propelled guns and infantry, German infantry infiltration, had meant that the whole area around his Hartenstein headquarters was, as the Germans called it, a witch's cauldron, in which very many casualties were being taken. And very soon, those men would become wounded or would lose their lives. In the end, the number of troops here at Osterberg dwindled down to a very small number, about two thousand of them, 
They had no supplies, no ammunition, no water, no food. So a plan was made to withdraw with the help of the 43rd Wessex Division, which was on the other side, and uh, Canadian and British engineers with boats. On the evening of Monday the 25th of September, the escape from Arnhem, codenamed Operation Berlin, began. Under cover of an artillery barrage, 35 boats shuttled back and forth across the Lower Rhine, bringing the survivors to safety, all the time harassed by machine gun and mortar fire. We all pulled out at the appropriate time. I didn't see an awful lot of it because I had two signals with me and we took a wounded soldier to a dressing station, which I'd seen in the morning, that morning, which was a British dressing station. But when I arrived, it was in German hands, so I was invited to stay. And I managed to skip the dressing station, got down to the river in daylight, and managed to be lucky and swim across with another Royal Signals officer of the Light Regiment. We, we swam together, and they were firing at us, and he got hit and drowned. His body was picked up about three or four miles down river later on, and I was lucky and got across. The urgency of the withdrawal meant that the badly wounded had to be left behind as the panzers rolled towards the river. The Germans were completely taken aback by this. They thought the British were actually reinforcing uh, the bridgehead and not withdrawing. The Germans could not believe that having taken such losses that the British would actually give it up. So when they pulled out that night, they were completely taken aback. The withdrawal succeeded in its objective, and 2,163 men were rescued. Among them, the exhausted General Urquhart. It was a remarkable plan that was perhaps one of the best run things about Operation Market Garden. It was a remarkable success, showing great flexibility of mind on Urquhart's part. 2,163 men may have been rescued during Operation Berlin, but this was out of a total of 10,000 men deployed. Around 1,200 British and Polish troops had lost their lives. To the south, American total losses approached 4,000 dead, wounded or captured and the objective of Operation Market Garden had not been achieved. The city of Arnhem remained in German hands. The war would continue well into 1945. What if the radios had worked? What if the enemy hadn't been quite so strong? What if 30 Gore had got to the bridge? Would the war have ended during the Christmas of, of 1944? It was really a glorious failure on the part of the British and the Poles at Arnhem. And there are so many things that go into making it one of the most famous battles that has ever been fought. And the airborne troops are at the centre of it and they have a great deal of mystique about them. And Arnhem was one of the key battles that went into giving them the fighting spirit that airborne troops are now world famous for.